This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. everybody to Wrestling Omakase. It is episode number 162 and this week I am pleased to be joined by a returning guest. Hello TJ. Hey John, how's it going? Pretty good. What's been up with you? I know the answer is nothing for everybody but I still ask every week. Yeah, not a whole lot. I had to go back home to, like I live in Philly for like the past couple years but I had to go back home to West Virginia because both my in-laws had to get surgery so we're back there taking care of them. That is and, that is undoubtedly yeah. the most exciting thing anyone's told me in like three months. So <laughs> I hope I hope their surgery went well. Yeah, they're all doing fine, and I'm I'm happy to be able to come back and help them. Since we we both work from home right now, yeah. it's just dealing with all the people back in West Virginia. Yeah. Well, all the like half the people not wearing masks anymore, <laughs> or ever probably. But yeah, I haven't. I I I'd love to tell you if. Uh, People are wearing masks here in New York, but I don't think I've gone out of my house in like two weeks. So <laughs> I'm just like, I'm planted firmly here. I, got, I work from home. We get everything delivered. I just have no reason to leave the house, I guess. So. Yes, yeah, hey, yeah. I, I used to get mad up in Philly with people not wearing the, ma- like the mask right, cause like not covering their nose or whatever. But at this point, I can't complain about them anymore. At least they're trying. <laughs> at least they have a mask somewhere on their face, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, lo- the last time I went out in New York and New Jersey, like, a few weeks ago now, I guess people were wearing them, so that's good. Uh, pretty universal, but I mean, you can't go in anywhere here without wearing them. So, mm-hmm. you know. well, it's like I back in Philly, I was basically like ordering my groceries ahead of time and then going and picking them up. But this time, I decided to go in the store, and not a good idea because <laughs> like Walmart requires you wear a mask to go in, but then as soon as you're in, it doesn't matter; they don't enforce it. Yeah, well, what are you gonna do? I guess. But, uh, you know, it's just, uh, who knows how long this will last. I bought a bunch, I bought a bunch more, like, uh, wacky anime masks, so at least I can tell everybody I'm a huge nerd when they look at my <laughs> face. But I, I got a bunch from, uh, the, the villainous Isekai, you know? Mm. Um, so, Hamifura. Yeah, see, I think I saw that you posted that on Twitter. Yeah. I want, oh, no, to I, some, put... I want to get some masks sometime because I don't have any like designs really. I have to have basic masks. Uh, I got all mine on Redbubble, so I, I don't think they're actually paying anybody. I think it's just like <laughs> they're stealing these designs and making masks out of them. But whatever, what are you gonna do? Like, yeah, yeah. But uh... well, I mean, they're cracking down on all that copyright shit right now because, like, I know one streaming like anime streaming site just got taken down like yesterday. Oh yeah, with a Kiss Anime. But uh, I'm glad I'm glad I got in. I got my mass orders in before they got. Uh, oh wait, Kids Anime got taken down. Really? Wow. Yeah. Holy shit! I didn't even hear about that. Holy shit! Yeah, like I don't really use it too much anymore. But it's like I, I really sh- that really surprised me when I woke up to that yesterday. <laughs> wow. That that site lasted like ten years, something like that. It's been forever. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I have yeah. I I don't think I use it very often either. I have a, uh, you know. I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of streaming services and stuff. I just very rarely need to, you know, find stuff illegally. I guess, but uh, yeah, that sucks. I know a lot of people that use it. What are you gonna do? I guess. Uh, I think it was what Japan cracked down on it. Yeah, wow. Yeah, Japan's been cracking down on like the 
stuff, especially in Japan, but I guess they're now starting to try and mess with the overseas people too now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes them, they make so much money off all that stuff. I guess I'm not that surprised. But mm. I know that, I remember they had passed some law, I feel like, earlier this year that was going to make it easier for them to crack down. So I guess this is finally the result now. But yeah, maybe, he's really going to start going into effect like 2021 early. Maybe COVID like delayed it. Maybe they got so distracted with COVID that that, that Kiss anime survived like six more months than it would have. Be kind of funny to think about, but anyway, uh, R.I.P. Kiss anime. I used you several times, probably <laughs> a more more than once. I think I used Kiss anime, but uh, not more than once. Less than ten, I think, would be the ex- would somewhere in that range. But but yeah, I'm glad I got my uh, my Hami for a pillow before they cracked down on Red Bubble too. It's very yeah. it's very cute. But yeah, Howie Furret, it's a good little transition. We're going to be doing um, the next anime Omakase will be about that show. So if you watched it from the spring, uh, it's also called, I think the English title is like, My Next Life as a Villainous, right, I think? So, Something you know, like that, yeah. Yeah, so if you if you saw that show in, in the spring season, uh, Nicole and I have already recorded half of the episode. Uh, we're going to do the other half probably tomorrow, I think. Uh, it's turning out to be another long one because we both had a lot of stuff to say about uh, what a delightful show it is. So we go through the whole season and everything. And that will be up on the Wrestling Omakase Patreon. Uh, of course, Anime Omakase is just one of many shows that you get on the Wrestling Omakase Patreon for $5 a month. Uh, if you're not into anime, there's a ton of wrestling content too, obviously. Um, we're in the middle of our Naito Ishii series right now. So I just did the fifth episode of that um, last week, which or last Thursday, which was the Wrestling Duntaku 2016 match, Naito's only successful defense from his first title reign. Uh, that was a really fun one. I talked a little bit, uh, talked about being in the building for uh, seeing Naito win the title. Um, you know, because since that happened between the two matches, uh, I talked a lot about the actual match at Duntaku, which I think is, you know, is honestly even better than I remembered. So that I mean, that's an awesome Naito Ishii match. So pretty much all of them <laughs> have been really great so far, unsurprisingly. But, uh, yeah, so we have half of that series up. The other half, we're you know still to come, uh, you know on the Patreon. The entire Tanahashi Okada series is up, uh, so all you can listen to all fourteen episodes now for the for your five dollars. We do every single Tanahashi Okada match in history. Uh, we just did coverage of the King of DDT and the Tokyo Joshi Princess Cup. So uh, all three the the three nights with uh, both tournaments from last weekend. We you know we have a, an episode for each day. Uh, of the two tournaments, and then for the Tokyo Joshi quarterfinals, uh, we did another one uh, yesterday. So you know we have all that stuff up there on the Patreon, and then you know we have a Sengoku Lord review, um, you know lots of other bonus content on there, and then obviously you get full five match episodes. So if you're if you're missing the five matches episodes, we haven't done one on the free feed in a few weeks now. Uh, you, the last one on there was with Todd Martin uh, from the PW Torch. Had a great time with Todd. The next one next weekend for subscribers will be with Garrett Kidney from uh, VOW and Wednesday War Games. So we're going to start rolling out the poll probably tomorrow for that for patrons. So yeah, if you're a patron, you get to vote uh, exclusively on that the fifth match poll for those episodes. So you can join now and vote in the vote for the fifth match for that episode. Listen to that episode. Uh, it'll be a great great time, you know, as those episodes always are. So you can check it out at patreon.com slash wrestling omakase patreon.com slash wrestling omakase like i said five dollars all it takes there's no multiple tiers you just pay your five bucks and you get access to everything we've ever done everything we will do so definitely check that out all right so let's talk we're going to talk about three well i guess four shows uh the new japan strong week two the all japan august 15th uh at sushi yoki memorial show and the two stardom uh, five-star gp shows from corican so those are the four shows we'll be talking about here um so we're gonna do it in those or in that order so we'll start with uh new japan strong week two from august 14th um you know this is another good little show i would say i, I the, i've enjoyed both weeks of the so far I, I like i said last week i hadn't watched any of those lines break collision shows so i wasn't quite sure what to expect and I, I don't really know how different it was from the 
lines break collision but as far as like what strong it by itself has been like so far i mean you know if, if this is if you're gonna have a weekly quote-unquote american uh even though it's obviously a japanese company but it's taped in america and features almost all american wrestlers uh you know american weekly wrestling show i mean this would be close to my ideal i mean it's just you know four it's a, only an hour long you just have four matches they're all action uh the promo time is like five seconds instead of you know 30 minutes and you know it's just very serious and very uh straightforward wrestling i mean i don't this is pretty much you know it's not it's nothing that's gonna like fucking blow you away or anything and none of these matches are like match of the year caliber but i mean you know i mean maybe this, i'm sure this is a hot take to some people but i this is what i wish dynamite was i mean you know maybe maybe if you cut an hour off of dynamite and get rid of all the other crap you know mjf uh, fucking work shoot promos like apparently they did last week uh oh, that was awful <laughs> i think you uh, I shouldn't start ranting about aw but like come on like wwe is doing this work shoot sh- shit like every fucking week and this is what you decided to counter with uh, mjf being like, i'm not going to lay down for john moxley like who the fuck wants to see that shit from the supposed alternative it's just sh- fucking shit yeah, it's like I actually watch AEW every week, but it's just I, I can't do this MJF shit anymore. It's especially like now that he's doing like a whole like political bullshit. I just and now like even like this past week, like that laying down in the ring and acting like oh he, Mox is hard to work with backstage shoot work, work shoot work shoot shit like I don't know it's just stupid to me. I mean like WWE has been up their ass with that for like years now and they they did it they've been doing it again with this Randy. And Drew feud. So, like, why would you be like, yeah, you know what we need to do is more of that. That's what the American wrestling fan wants to say is people talking about backstage politics. Don't have enough of that mm-hmm. uh, from the from the fucking leader. It's like just talk about how you want to be the champion. Talk about how you want to beat John Moxley. I mean, it's, this really isn't hard. Like, why do we have to make every every feud in American wrestling now has to be about? Uh, you know, oh, he's a he's bad in the room, and oh, I'm not going to lay down for him. It's just so stupid. It's like, we know it's fake. You don't have to tell us while we're trying to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, like you were saying, like, I really been, I've really, i really been enjoying, like, the format they've been doing for these U.S. shows in Japan, or yeah. for New Japan. Yeah, I mean, this is, that's what I'm saying. Like, this is so more, like, so straightforward. Just a bunch of guys having matches. I mean, this is a lot, a lot better. I mean, like, you know, you definitely notice the lack of crowd, especially now that I've gotten used to the the clap crowds that everybody hates in japan i've gotten so used to them now that it, it barely even bothers me and like you know you can there's still definitely spots where you're like oh, i wish people could cheer for that but nothing like when i first started watching but now going back to this when you're used to people being able to at least react uh with the clapping is it is really jarring so that's the one big downside but you know uh as far as the actual matches here i guess we can start with the opener which was clark connors and jordan clearwater against barrett brown and logan regal uh so i know clark connors obviously i you know not really (laughs) obviously i think any new japan fan would know clark connors the other three i have no clue on uh clearwater is 23 it looks like he's been wrestling since 2016 uh barrett brown is 26 he's been wrestling since 20 also since 2016 and he did do a couple Lions Break Project shows at the uh, Bushi Road Anime Convention 2019. I think that was, was that the year where, uh, what's his name? Uh, El, El Fantasmo came up with the very, uh, very easy, cheap heat method of just coming coming out and being like, I hate anime. I think that was that show, right? That probably was. I, <laughs> did ELP work those shows? I don't even remember. I, I didn't watch them, so I don't really know. Yeah, I didn't watch. Them. I didn't watch them either. But I've heard people say talk about that. Like he, I think it was either it was either 2019 or the year before because I think I think they did this two years. But he just came out and was like, "I hate anime. It's stupid." And that's like the, that's the equivalent of like insulting the sports team, I guess, when you're wrestling at an anime convention. Yeah, so I just, guess so. It was just kind of funny. But yeah, so he worked those uh, shows in 2019. Uh, Logan Regal is 28. Uh, he's been wrestling since 2018. He also did those Lions Break Project shows. Uh, so I, I think you watch a little more American Indies than me. Do you have any? Have you ever seen any of these guys? 
Yeah, I've never seen any of these guys. Like, okay. they like uh, what's like, what's like you saying they worked like those Lions Break Collision shows. Those would have been the chance I've seen them. Like beyond that, I don't know what, I don't know what they work. And then, yeah, all I know is the one guy is like trained by, uh, that was trained by Carl Anderson because they kept mentioning it in all commentary. Who do you remember which one that was? I don't remember either. Oh, uh, it was a uh, Clearwater. Oh, Clearwater. Okay. So Barrett Brown. Well, that's how he got in, I guess. So there you go. Good for him. Yes, I'm assuming. Uh, Barrett Brown pinned Jordan Clearwater in 703 with a schoolboy. Um, you know, so Connors came out like pushing everybody, and th- right away I noticed that Jordan Clearwater looked about seven feet tall compared to these three tiny men. I mean, it was really, really uh, something. Um, yes, I had to look it up. He's a six two apparently, oh, at yeah. least according to Cage Match. He he looked much taller with these dudes. Like it's like how uh, Himika is like five seven, I guess, but looks like she's like. 7-5 in there with some yeah. of these stardom wrestlers. But yeah, so this was uh, very fast action. Everybody just worked a mile a minute here. Uh, Clearwater looked fine, but then Connors tagged in. It was just a house of fire. Uh, we got a big strike exchange with Connors and Brown just chopping the, sl- the shit out of each other. A nice back elbow from Brown 2 to counter. Uh, and then Clearwater tagged himself back in and got rolled up by Brown for the fan. Uh, this was, like, apparently seven minutes long, but seriously felt like it was two minutes, and I mean that as a compliment. Like, it was so fast that I, I blinked and it was over. Uh, it was all action, super fun. I'm going to go three and a half. I think it was pretty difficult to have a better seven-minute tag team match than that. A great start to the show. Yeah, so like you said, it was, it was really fast pace work. Or it worked really fast pace, and I thought uh, Clark was really the like highlight of it because he was, like you said, like he's a, it's a ball of fire. He was... Uh, like for like a, I think it was like middle of the match, he was like tossing Brown around the ring, and then like started beating him down in the corner. Which I love that that stuff. And then like the rest of them were like it was so fast paced, it's hard to like really take note, like uh, get an idea of the rest of them. I do think uh, Clearwater looked really good or decent for his age, and I think he's got a great look anyway. I Other saw here. I think I saw people yeah. complaining about Clearwater before the match, like saying he sucked or something, and. When I actually watched him, he looked fine. But I guess, I guess you can't really judge from seven minute tag. Yes, yeah, see, I, I thought he looked fine. Like he's really young, and he's if he gets more reps in with New Japan, I think he's gonna improve a lot. Yeah, and I just think he looks great anyway. Like the height and his overall look, like his gear is kind of not great. But beyond that, I thought he looked great. He looks kind of like maybe just because he's tall and like you know has that like generic white wrestler look. But he looks kind of like a mid two thousands like I don't know OVW guy or something. But not, oh, yeah, I, I don't I definitely get that vibe. I don't mean that in a bad way at all, though. I mean, you know, that kind of look could work really well in New Japan. Uh, match number two was PJ Black, Mysterioso, and Blake Christian defeating TJP, ACH, and Alex Zane. Uh, PJ Black pinning Alex Zane in 755 with the placebo effect. Um, you know, so again, for these wrestlers here, PJ Black, I think most people would know. He was Justin, Justin Gabriel in WWE. Uh, he's done on some ROH and stuff, so I think that name is pretty familiar to people. Uh, Mysterioso, also known as Mysterioso Jr. He was on the those last Lions Break Collision shows. Uh, he's been wrestling since 2011. No age listed on his cage match profile, so age unknown. Uh, <laughs> Blake Christian, 23. Uh, he's been wrestling since only last year. It uh, looks like he did some GCW, so people who watched that would know him from there. Uh, Alex Zane is another age unknown guy, but he's been wrestling since 2007, so a veteran uh, in these matches here, or the veteran, I should say. And you know, he's another guy who did the anime con shows last year, plus uh, New Beginning in USA this year before COVID, uh, before everybody's lives ended. Uh, <laughs> ACH and uh, TJP I don't really need any introduction. I mean, they're both TJP's been a regular for a while now. ACH was a regular. And it's great to see him back in New Japan ring, even on these weird shows. I think, you know, uh, if he if he can, I, I've heard rumors that he, you know, his plan is to go back to Japan for New Japan when, whenever he's able to do that. And I still think that's a great fit for him. I'd much rather see him there than fucking AEW or something. Yes, yeah, so I, th- I think he's definitely going to end up back in Japan once we're able to go back to Japan. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's just a great fit. So. I mean, he he was always super over too with the Japanese fans, so I just they always seemed like they really liked him. Uh, but yeah, so ACH he looked great immediately here. He just tagged in and bounced around the ring like a damn pinball. Just looked really excited to be in there too. 
PJ Black, PJ Black. I don't want to keep saying back. I'm sorry to PJ Black. Uh, he slowed things down with an abdominal stretch on TJP. A, a weird choice in a match that was all action up to that point, but what can you do? Uh, there was this great double team Rana with Alex Zane using ACH as a springboard to get at the top rope. That was pretty cool. Uh, and Zane did a shooting star knee attack to PJ Black and almost got the pin uh, before Mysterioso made the save. Uh, Zane and Christian were a little sloppy, but Christian, you know, he kind of made up for the great dive to the outside. Uh, and then PJ Black came in with his springboard 450 for the pin on Zane, the placebo effect. So yeah, this dragged a little by the end, but it was still pretty fun. I would go three and a quarter. I uh, had a good time here. Definitely good little, good little six man. Yes, yeah, so- I it was great, just great to see ACH back in like, a New Japan ring. Technically not in Japan, but it was just great to see him back in this environment. And he was really like the highlight of the match for me. I thought the other guys kind of ranged from fine to good. Like you were saying, I think Zane and Christian were kind of a little bit sloppy at times. But I think, especially Christian, I think he he looked better than Zane in my opinion. And I think he's going to benefit from being in like the more structured environment of New Japan. Like I, I watch ECW like just about every show. So I've, I've seen these two a lot, a lot of the time against each other. And I kind of grade GCW versus new Japan differently. I thought, I think they're like great for GCW, but then it's like moving into a new Japan ring. I don't think either one's really transitioned well yet, but Zane, it's like, or not Zane, uh, Christian, it's like his first actual match here. So I'm willing to give him a little bit of benefit of the doubt. And plus he's younger. So I think he has more room to grow. I don't, I don't think Zane's really going to fit well overall in New Japan, but I'm happy he's getting booked nonetheless, I guess. I didn't watch any of his previous New Japan stuff, so I don't know how he did in that. I will say, like, I, I don't know if this is um, if this is the same for most New Japan fans, but even in more, you know, quote-unquote regular times, I guess my standard for, like, filling out the undercard on a New Japan USA show versus my standard for getting flown over to Japan on a tour are very different. Like, I don't mind Zane or any of these guys, uh, you know, just in New Japan USA working undercard tags. But, you know, if they, they fly them to Japan, be another story. But, you know, I don't know if you yeah, feel it's like... Yeah, like, out of, like, the people here, like, the only ones that I could see them flying in for New Japan is TJP and ACH, and that's just because they've already done that in the past. Yeah. At least for ACH. I could see them flying but... in PJ Black, but I don't know. No. They might just because of the ROH connection, because he is signed there. Yeah. Uh, the third match of the night was the New Japan Cup 2020 USA semifinal. David Finley defeating Tamatonga in a 7-10 with the Prima Nocta to advance to the final. Um, I never really thought these results here were in doubt. I always thought it would be Finley and Kenta. Did you feel any differently? Once we got out of the first round, I definitely that's pretty much what I expected. Yeah. I was kind of iffy on whether Kenta would lose to Fredericks or not since that was a match originally planned for the New Japan Cup. But now that Fredericks is already established before the match, there's no reason for him not to get pinned by Kenta. And they kind of need Kenta to, I guess, a future prediction. I think Kenta's going to win this whole thing because who else do they really have right now, especially with Juice out injured? Yeah. Uh, I, the match started with some, this match started with some good little action, big drop kick from Tama. Uh, we slowed down quick though with Tama beating Finley down for a while. Not super exciting, not bad or anything either, just kind of there. Uh, Finley came back with a nice senton and a backdrop suplex for a two count as we got the five minute call. Uh, we got a nice little reversal sequence, which of course is one of Tama's big strengths. And he hit a great Tongan twist for a two count. Uh, Tama went for the gun stun, but Finley rolled him up for two. He turned another attempt at it into a neck breaker out of a suplex for another two count. Uh, he goes for the prima nocta, but Tama pushes him out. But Finley dodges the singer splash, hits a stunner, and then the prima nocta for the pin, sending him, sending him to the finals. Uh, I thought this was a good little three-star match. Nothing that's going to blow you away, but it was enjoyable enough. So I don't know if you had any different thoughts on it. Yes, I, honestly, I didn't really like this one that much. I thought it was a little bit boring. Like, I think Finlay was really trying, but it's just like, I don't know. Like, I'm happy Finlay got some revenge for dropping the title back to G.O.D. earlier in the year. But as far as this match, like, it never really got me invested in it at all. I was just, for like a seven-minute match, it felt longer than that just because I was just kind of bored watching it, to be honest. Yeah, that's But true. like I said, I think I think Finlay at least was really, looked like, looked good. It's just, I don't know. 
for me, the match just didn't work today. Uh, and afterwards, Finley cuts a very short promo, just pointing out that without Jado there, G.O.D. can't beat him. Uh, you know, without Jado to swing the kendo stick and stuff. And he promised to win New Japan Cup USA next week. So there you go. Uh, the main event was Kenta defeating Jeff Cobb in the other semifinal in 1438 with an inside cradle to also advance to the finals. Uh, so Kenta still came out to the book club theme for whatever reason for the second week in a row. Uh, I like my theory that they just can't find an MP3 of it. <laughs> like, they just can't. They just don't have an MP3 of it anywhere. But I don't yeah, know. That's what confused me. I was like, he keeps coming out to this. I'm like, do y'all really, it's not that hard to email someone a file. <laughs> Really? Yeah, like, hey guys, can we have a theme song? Because it's not, it's not like it's out on anything. Because it wasn't included in the, in the newest album. But it's like, do you really not have the New Japan theme music guy's uh, email address? Like, I don't understand. Anyway, uh, at the start of this match, Kevin Kelly mentions that two weeks from now is Road to Fighting Spirit Unleashed. Unleashed, I should say. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. I, I guess we're gonna get a Fighting Spirit Unleashed show in a empty building. Uh, I don't know what they would be able to put on that to make it worthy of a, you know, a what? what I guess it's not that big of a name, so I guess it's fine. But you know, I don't. I don't think Moxie's going to be able to work it. I think people are setting themselves up for disappointment if they think Moxie's going to be allowed to work in the U.S. But yeah. Uh, uh, so this match started with this weird little spot where Kenta dropped out of a delayed suplex from Cobb in a way that looked kind of awkward, like they freeze up for a split second. But it does lead to a nice drop kick from Cobb. Uh, it's all Cobb early on until he tries the Gachimuchi salt, but Kenta gets his knees up, allowing him to take over with his kicks and a swinging neck breaker. Uh, we, Kenta's hard kicks are just really great for this format. They just echo in the empty studio. Uh, you know, just really, really make a great sound all around the studio. Uh, then we get an extended leg scissors from Kenta before Cobb makes the ropes to break. Uh, Cobb makes a comeback, but Kenta puts him down with a running power slam. Pretty impressive, given the size difference. Uh, we get the 10-minute call. Kenta hits a top rope clothesline for a two-count. He follows up with a draping DDT, as this match is really all Kenta, other than Cobb's brief opening flurry, and then one more brief flurry in the middle there. Uh, Kenta uses the Shibata dropkick in the corner, heads back up top, and hits a nice double stomp, but Cobb kicks out at two. Uh, Cobb finally comes back and gets the Gachi, Gachi Muchi salt this time for a close two-count. Uh, Cobb tries to hit the tour of the islands, but Kenta grabs on the referee and then bumps him. Uh, we get a visual pinfall with Cobb hitting some kind of, like, bridging power slam. I'm sure he has a name for it, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> but there's no ref. Uh, Kenta goes for a low blow, but Cobb is actually ready for it and catches his leg. Uh, Cobb hits a big elbow and then goes for the tour of the islands, but Kenta gets out of it and this time gets a low blow and rolls him up for the pin. Uh, I really didn't like the finish there. I mean, really, we really need a ref bump a visual pin, and a low blow to protect Jeff Cobb. It just seems a little much. Uh, but yeah, the match itself, I, I don't know. It was a hard one to write because, I mean, it was basically a Kenta squash before that. Uh, so I guess I, I, you know, I guess they wanted to protect Cobb, but I kind of just wish they let Kenta look that dominant and just beat him. Uh, but, I, you know, whatever. Uh, bizarre match. I like plenty of it, but it was also a little slow and I hated the finish. So I decided to go three and a quarter. Yeah, I don't know. Do you, did you like this any more than I did? Yeah, that's it. I kind of, I didn't like this a whole like that much really, but that's just because I'm kind of lower on Cobb anyway. Like, I like a lot of his like PWG and ROH stuff, but it's like as soon as he gets into New Japan and kind he kind of like works more of a heavyweight style when he's better at like doing having someone like a flippy boy wrestler like Osprey or whoever, whatever indie guy to do flips and bump for him. And uh, Kenta's not really that kind of guy to work that way for him. And like you said, like I think it's kind of slow and be, to begin with, especially like they were doing like the kenta stalling uh stuff to start with which it works if it's like someone like naito which is kind of keeps you entertaining like during their title match but for this like Cobb just kind of stood there and kind of did nothing really while uh kenta was doing the stalling stuff and it's like you said like the i didn't like the finish that much i don't know why they need to protect Cobb that much like maybe it's because of whatever the secret um promotion he signed to that he won't tell anyone about yet (laughs) but it's just I don't know why they really need to protect Cobb that much to get a visual pinfall and then also only won or only lost because of a nut shot and a roll up. So I don't know. It was kind of a bizarre match, really. Yeah. I mean, bizarre is definitely a good word for it. So 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not like it was bad or anything. It just was really weird. So the final next week, like we said, is Kenta versus Finley. I definitely think Kenta's winning. I don't think that's uh, that's really up for debate, but I guess we'll see. Uh, overall, the tag matches on the show, I think, were the highlight. The tournament matches were fine, too. Uh, you know, nothing, but I think that the opener was my favorite match of the night, for sure. Uh, but yeah, these, this was another short and watchable show. Definitely uh, nothing I regret watching. So, you know, another another fun show, and I'll be back next week to see the end of the New Japan Cup, which, uh, as we found... So we at the end of the show, Kenta cut a short little English promo at the end. Uh, just told everybody should should shut up and watch him, I think he said, which is fine. Uh, we heard that Rocky Romero will be in tag action next week, but then they announced uh, afterward on like some kind of post-show that Jay White will also be in action next week. So that's definitely cool. Yes, yeah, so I'm assuming he's going to be a big part of this uh, Fighting Spirit Unleashed tour, or whatever they're going to do. Yeah. And then I, like, I'm assuming, like you were saying, Mox isn't going to come and defend the title, so... It's probably going to be more like a briefcase thing. So I, I'm assuming Kenta might like defend the shot at Mox against somebody. I mean, it'd be awesome if they did Kenta versus Jay White, but I don't know if they, they're willing to do that. But like that's probably the biggest match they could do is just have White challenge Kenta for the th- briefcase, even though they're both in Bullet Club. I mean, the problem is like half the people that are there are in Bullet Club as far as yeah. like actual New Japan people. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, good little show. Definitely looking forward to the finals next week. Uh, okay, so the second thing we're going to talk about is the All Japan at Sushi Aoki Memorial Show from Korokin. Uh, that took place yesterday, August 15th. Um, so it's the first time we're covering All Japan on the show in a while. I really, I haven't been super into what they've been doing, and I haven't been following it super closely, especially since Ashino uh, lost his title shot. You know, I just really haven't been that. Uh, this is probably the the most I felt disconnected from All Japan in a while, maybe maybe it since the since the start of the post Mudo era, I just really haven't been into it. But uh, you know, I'm definitely gonna. I'm, I wanted to watch this show, uh, just to, you know, because first of all, it just timed really well with uh, when I was record, planning to record this, and second of all, you know, I wanted to get like back in the swing of things ahead of the Champion Carnival. But I have to say, this show was really nothing special. Uh, you know, there was some good stuff on it, but like really nothing. You need to go out of your way to see. I think. Yeah, say, like, overall, I enjoyed this show, but like you said, like, it's nothing you need to drop and watch immediately. I don't think there's anything that's going to go on your spreadsheet, whatever, notebook, all that nonsense. But I did enjoy, I'd enjoyed the show a lot, but that's partially because I have been following All Japan this entire run because I love Enfants, so I'm going to pretty much watch anything they're on. Well, I like Enfants, too, and they were in the fucking op- two opening tags, like, doing nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck are we doing? With, with, like, they, they really blew that off with... Uh... Achino losing, and they're just like in the opening two matches, d- doing going under seven minutes both times. It's like I don't know. I mean, I guess being down cycled is one thing, but it's like it's not like all Japan has much else to to go with. It's like why mm-hmm. are we why are we down cycling them to this degree? It is really weird. At yeah. least they actually won, unlike the recent stuff for them. But <laughs> yeah, I think this card is just because it's the memorial show for it's, like, Aoki. It's kind of I wouldn't take card placement too much in mm. thought but i mean uh ashino is gonna have like a singles match with sato so that should be good yeah that that, the month. that should be really good that's a good point point. and then you have all the champions carnival and we'll see how that goes for them i guess uh the opener was yuma ayagi and atsuki ayagi losing to kuma arashi and hokoto omori from enfants uh omori pinned atsuki with a german suplex hold in 653 i would call this a perfectly fine opener Nothing that's going to knock your socks off, but all four guys look good. I went two and three quarters. Yeah, I'll say it was more like just um, character shit from uh, Kuma and Hokuto just being. Kuma's funny. I always yeah, like Kuma. Kuma was really funny in this match, and I loved. Um, I think it was uh, Hokuto has like some new pose, like the kind of looks like a chef kiss or something now. Ever since he joined Enfants, and I liked uh, Yuma was like basically taunting him with it, like in the middle of the match. But um, yeah, it's like you said, it's like it's nothing really crazy to watch. But I did, I was happy that Hokuto ended up picking up the win at least, and he had this like curb stomp like move near the end. I don't know, like it wasn't really a curb stomp, it was like a scissor kick almost. I don't know what to describe it at, but that's definitely new, I think. So if he can tighten that up, I think it's a good addition to his um, move set if he can get it worked out fully. 
Uh, match two was Shotaro Ashino and Yusuke Kodama beating Yoshitatsu and Yusuke Okada. Uh, Ashino pinning Okada with his T-bone suplex in 607. Uh, this was all Enfants beating on Okada for a while, you know, especially early on. Uh, Yoshitatsu did get a hot tag, but quickly tagged back out to Okada, and then Ashido put him away. Uh, I thought this match was very average. I would go two and a half. Nothing wrong with it, but not much stood out either. Yeah, like one of the highlights of the match really was uh, Yoshitatsu was kind of coaching um, Okada to like do a move off the top, top rope early on, which gave Enfants the, the opportunity to... Um, take advantage and like basically start beating up on okada a whole lot but then later in the match he was doing it again trying to get okada to do the uh move off the top rope and finally he was able to hit it because yoshitatsu was actually there this time to stop uh, kodama from knocking him off the top but yeah beyond that it was, like, it was, it was a fine match nothing crazy match number three ultimo dragon and tajiri defeating francesco akira and rising hayato uh ultimo pinned hayato with the Ilamaji straw cradle and 842 um, get some nice grappling from Tajiri and Akira early, and then Akira somehow won a shoulder block battle against him, despite looking approximately 200 pounds lighter. I don't know how that works exactly, but sure. Uh, Akira, Akira's, like, Joshi-esque screaming is pretty funny. It's really not a bad idea during these quiet, uh, quieter clap-only crowds, so, you know, going to give him a shout-out there. Good screaming, pal. Uh, pinned him in 842, like I said. Pretty fun little match. I would go three stars flat. Uh, you know, nothing, again, nothing's going to knock your socks off, but good time. Yeah, it's like really the highlight of the match was the early stuff with uh, Tijiri and Akira. I haven't watched their, like, I think it was like some Hungarian title that Tijiri has. He defended against Akira. <laughs> yeah, I haven't yeah. watched that yet, but I heard it's all right. But I definitely think you can kind of see that Tijiri really likes this kid because he was giving him a decent amount in this match, which he doesn't always do. Yeah. But. Yeah, it's like Ultimo was kind of just there, and then his the highlight of Ultimo in this match is really just him coming out to that his music. I like that a lot, at least. I like like when they were coming out. Tajiri was kind of just waiting for him to come out, and then as soon as Ultimo came out of the like the curtain, he like jumped up in the air and like did like some heel kicks or something. I don't know. It was <laughs> stupid, but it, yeah, like you said, like it was a it was a decent match, just mostly because of Akira and Tajiri with their little portions. Uh, match four was the Atsushi Aoki Memorial Tag Match. Uh, Hikaru Sato and Takuya Wada defeating Kagatora and Gosamaru in 11.42. Sato tapping out Gosamaru with a leg hold. Um, so I feel like a couple guys need, here need introductions. I assume nobody needs an introduction for Sato or Kagatora. I mean, Sato's been in All Japan forever, and Kagatora has been in Dragon Gate forever. Uh, Takuya Wada is a former welterweight king of Pancras, so he comes from a shoot fighting background. He's done some appearances in Hard Hit. I, I don't know if he's appeared in All Japan before this. Ha, ha, do you know, TJ? He doesn't have a cage match profile, so it's hard to look up. Yeah, I have no idea. I'm pretty sure I've seen him wrestle before, but it probably was like Hard Hit or something. Yeah. Uh, Ghost of Mario, though, on the other hand, has been all over. Uh, like his, If you look at his cage match, like the, he's one of these guys that wrestles in like 15 promotions in some years. Uh, but he's been recently working a lot out of uh, Ryukyu and Okinawa in the past three years. Um, he even got a New Japan appearance out of that during their the annual Q offer match on the Okinawa show on February 26th. It ended up being uh, New Japan's last event before the world ended and the you know the coronavirus shut down. So, uh, but yeah, so that's Gozumaru. I, I really I was way more impressed with Wada than Gozumaru. Wada Gozumaru looked like kind of a stiff to me, whereas Wada, you know, he he obviously he you know there's a couple of things where he was like a little out of position because he's very new at this, I guess, but his, like his, his grappling and all that stuff is really good in his kicks. So I don't know if you feel any differently about the two of them. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought Gosamaro was good to be like a guy that, that basically that, that Sato could work around and kind of beat up a little bit. But as far as like him doing anything himself, it wasn't really that impressive really. Uh, so the match started off with Sato, which is rocking Gosamaru with kicks, like you said. And then he gets a, a great, great leg takedown uh, into a submission attempt before Kagatora dives in to save. Uh, Wada and Kagatora tagged in and exchanged some more holds, some really good shoot-style grappling. Uh, Sato and Wada took turns just teeing off with kicks on Gosamaru, who seemed to be asking for it for some reason. I don't It's kind of funny. 
Um, we hit another gear after that with Kagator and Wada, who had a really fast-paced exchange. Uh, this is also where Wada seemed a little out of position a couple of times, but like I said, kind of understandable when he hasn't done that much wrestling. Uh, Gosamaru, you know, he may be more awkward than Wada in some ways, honestly. And like I said, he just comes off like a big stiff. Uh, but he ended up tapping out to a Sato leg hold around 11.42. A good little tag with some high-energy sequences, but also some awkward stuff. I would go three and a quarter. I enjoyed it. Yeah, so it was a fun match. It wasn't like anything blow away. I did like it. It was mostly like mat work and grappling, so it was a little bit of a change of pace compared to the earlier parts of the card and then what comes later, but... So, for no other reason, I'm happy that I did that because I kind of like more variety in my shows. But, yeah, like I said, it's, it was a decent match. It was nothing you need to go away to see. I, I really like Sato a lot in this match, but I think Sato's great. So Yeah, Sato's uh, awesome. Too surprising. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Sato's just always awesome. Uh, Takao Omori, Koji Iwamoto, Blackman Soray, and Osamu Nishimura defeated Masanabu Fuchi, Junakyama, Don Timura, and Sushi. In 11.39, Omori pinning Sushi with an axe bomber. Um, so the, the highlight here was Nishimura and Fuji having a physical old man battle. Uh, some hard European uppercuts from Nishimura especially. I'm like, dude, Fuji is even older than you. Like, calm down. <laughs> like, Jesus. But this was very, like, the old man was the highlight. Like, this was very dull after those two old guys were done. Um, especially Sushi, who I never even found him entertaining during his actual prime. And he was no more entertaining here when he's like, you know, however old Sushi is. Um, The brawl around ringside livened things up a little bit, but only a little bit. Uh, I really didn't like this magic. I went like two stars, mostly for the old man battle, but I did not enjoy myself. Yeah, this match is kind of just there, really. Like you said, like Fuchi and Ishimura going at it was really fun. And I liked uh, Iwamoto and uh, Tamura going at it, like on the outside. But... They did that, but then while they were all brawling on the outside, uh, showing what was actually interesting in Iwamoto and uh, Tamura. And I, I especially like the post match stuff with the Iwamoto and Tamura, like trying to just go at each other, and Akiyama, like barely even trying to break them up. Like, <laughs> yeah. he was so lazy about that. A- Akiyama was like, Look, I, I'm fucking cashed out here, buddies. Uh, I'm, I got that fucking cyber agent money now. I don't need this shit. That was basically Akiyama this entire match. So he was here because I- Aoki was his friend, I guess. But I mean, he really didn't give it- seem like he gave a shit about this match. Mm-hmm. I'm happy they at least kind of tried to use this match to continue the story of Tamura and Iwamoto's future junior title match, at least. Yeah. Uh, match number six, the All-Asia Tag Team Championship match. Uh, it was Ozami Kodaka and Yuko Miyamoto trying to make their fourth defense here, but they failed to do so as Zeus and Izanagi from Purple Haze that's what they're called, right? Purple Haze. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. they defeated Yankee 2 Kenju to win the All-Asia Tag Team titles in 1209. Uh, Izanagi reversing a Kodaka Brain Buster attempt into an inside cradle for a surprising pin. Uh, some really good action to start, especially with Zeus beating down Miyamoto. Uh, Miyamoto finally came de- back with a really nice lariat. Uh, Yankee 2 Kenju took over with some really cool double-team offense on Izanagi. I mean, that was, like, the highlight of the match. They were really going... Like, that, that took this match to another level for me. I mean, I, I was already enjoying it, but, like, you know, all of the really fast-paced double-team stuff was really good. Uh, Miyamoto did this awesome handspring back kick on Zeus, and then Kadaka followed up with a sick top rope reverse Rana on Izanagi. Really crazy bump for a two-count. And then Izanagi, like I said, suddenly reversed the Brain Buster into an inside cradle for a shocking pin. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I would go three and three quarters. Like, definitely match of the night, uh, you know, really by a mile up to this point. But, you know, the, the main event was good, too. But this was this was really good. So, you know, a, a few more minutes, and it probably would have been, like, you know, notebook level, like you said before. Yeah, up to this point, this is definitely, like, my favorite match of the night. Zeus and uh, Miyamoto are really my highlights of the match. But a lot of, like, the like re- like in their title defenses they've had the, during all the COVID and all that, I think Miyamoto's really been the highlight of it. Kodaka's been good as well, like, I mean, because he's Kodaka, he's always great, but especially in this match, like, Kodaka wasn't super involved. He always, like, obviously had those big spots you mentioned, but a lot of it was just Miyamoto and then Zeus coming in every now and then. I, like, I think Izanagi was good getting beat up, but whenever he was, like, actually trying to do anything, it wasn't that interesting. But, and then he was able to pick up another big win. I think it's, like, he's, what, well, he's pinned Kento... I forget who else he's pinned. I know he obviously pinned uh, Kodaka here, but 
Izanagi's been like sneakily getting a bunch of big pins for some reason. I guess this is the reason be to heat them up for this title match, but yeah, it's strange for me that Izanagi's getting all these big wins lately. And it's also strange that uh, for once, uh, Purple Haze aren't rushing to the ring to attack their opponents. <laughs> That's basically been the entire COVID era is like the, their opponents act like waiting, like not even paying attention. And then eventually like, then Purple Haze, their music hits and they run out to the ring and attack everyone. I think it was uh, Tajiri and Kai during like the June 30th show. Finally, someone was ready for them. And then they came through the side instead of up the ramp. But yeah, it was just weird seeing the match like just casually swole, uh, stroll up to the ring. They were being but respect. Guess... They were being respectful because of the Yoki Memorial Show, I guess. Yeah, and then plus they were the first. They they actually came out first for once. Usually they're the second to come out. That's a good point too. Uh, the main event: the Atsushi Yoki Memorial Six Man, uh, Suwama, Shuji Ishikawa, and Shigehiro Shigehiro Irie defeating Kento Miyahara, Jake Lee, and Yuji Okabayashi. Uh, Suwama pinning Kento with the last ride in 2056. Um, we get the big test of strength with Yuji and Suwama to start. Uh, after losing that battle, Yuji spotted Kento just kind of hanging out in the apron instead of holding the tag rope. And he gives his own partner a chop, uh, which is pretty funny. And then he, like, when, when Kento like, gets up and is looking at him, like, what the fuck was that for? He like pantomimes and like grabs the tag rope and is like, see this? You're supposed to hold this. It's pretty funny. Um... Irie got to shine in a big strike exchange with Okabayashi. He even put him down with a black hole slam at the end. Always good to see an XDDT guy like him doing well. So I'm happy about that. Uh, Yuji and Shuji seem to ha- have like a big hard-hitting exchange for old time's sake. Uh, like their exchange was really good. And then Jake Lee and Shuji had an exchange that looked pretty good too. Ending with Jake no-selling a German suplex from Shuji and hitting a sliding kick. Uh, I'll never give up on Jake Lee. I still, I still like. I look, he's like one of those guys that's become a running joke in the VOW Slack, especially with like it's like oh the Jake Lee reign will finally save things. But I still think the Jake Lee reign could be good whenever they finally do it. I don't know. I'm the last, the last person on the Jake Lee Van wagon, I guess. Yeah, I still like him. Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if he wins champions carnival this year i hope so we say that every year i feel like yeah, no, right <laughs> uh yuji chops kento some more to fire him up and kento responded by playing the drums on his big bald head that was really funny uh but they have, then suwama ends up pinning kento with the last ride after the typical kind of everybody runs in and hits moves on everyone else sequence uh this was good nothing that's gonna like fucking make your match of the year list but i enjoyed it i went three and a half so Yes, I enjoyed this a lot, and a lot of it was most it was because of um, Kento and Okabayashi's. What I don't know, I don't know where this came from. I guess Okabayashi was just tired of Kento's shit because even at the beginning of the match, Kento was like taking forever to take off his ring jacket, and Okabayashi like basically like, ripped it off him or something. <laughs> and like you said, like he chopped him to like because he wasn't ready to be like to get tagged in because he wasn't grabbing the tag rope. And then uh, even like it wasn't even just him; it was uh, Violence Giants were kind of doing the same thing to Irie because. Uh, I think Shuji was doing that one spot where you're hanging onto the ropes and like he was like stomping into Kento's back and then Irie got on top of his back to kind of add some pressure and then somehow Irie flipped over the top rope and dragged Su- or Ishikawa over with him and then Ishikawa was just pissed off at that and just started like stomping him on the outside I think even like Swama gave him a couple hits on the head because he was tired annoyed with him but yeah it's like really it's just the antics rather than the in-ring stuff was really the highlight of the match uh, so there you go. I would say, you know, this this was definitely not anything special as a show. Very forgettable. Um, you know, you'd be fine skipping it. I mean, I would say if if you got the time, at least you could watch the just the double main event. You know, the last two matches. Uh, you know, you you probably enjoy those two, but even those two are nothing that's like gonna fucking change your life or anything. So, uh, you know, hopefully all Japan gets a little more exciting with the Champion Carnival because right now it's not that exciting. So. I guess we'll say. Uh, That brings us to our last topic for this week, which is stardom. Uh, The five-star Grand Prix got underway on August 8th and 9th at Corrigan. Uh, We're going to talk about both those shows right now. Uh, We do have to mention, I guess, before we get into these two shows, there was supposed to be another show yesterday on August 15th in Osaka. Uh, It ended up being the latest in a string of last-minute COVID-related cancellations. Uh, I think what they said was that another wrestler who was not on the tour... 
uh, you know, had got tested positive, so they decided to cancel the show and bring everybody back to test them. Uh, we saw the, saw the same thing happen with New Japan with a house show last week and with Tokyo Joshi uh, for their what was supposed to be their, their semifinals of the Princess Cup uh, today, actually, on the 16th. Um, so this definitely seems to be something we're going to have to get used to during this era because, you know, the, Japan definitely has some, not not like America level of spread, but they definitely have some spread. And, you know, as long as it's even go, running at all, uh, you know, which some people say they shouldn't be doing at all, you know, as long as they are running, you know, it's I mean, it's definitely better to cancel these shows than to end up with a WWE situation where you have like, you know, multiple people in your locker room getting infected. So. Yeah, say it's even before this, you had I think there was a couple of Joshi promotions. I think it was Wave. Yeah, canceled Wave. like two shows in like the beginning of their Catch the Wave tournament, and like even uh, I think it was, it was either two AW or Just Tap Out canceled a bunch of shows or a couple of shows. Yeah, I think it was two AW. Yeah, I mean, but, it is yeah, like, you know what are you gonna do? I mean, just, I think I think uh, somebody else did too. I think Real Japan or somebody, but yeah, it's like that's kind of just what's gonna happen. Like you said, at least they're being careful and testing and all that. Um, so, I mean, they did say all the, the matches on the 15th will be rescheduled. So, you know, I mean, th- that was going to be some hot, they, like Utami and Momo was on that show. So definitely some stuff that I still want to say. So hopefully everything goes well. We haven't heard it exactly when they're going to resume yet, but, you know, just have to be very flexible right now, I guess. Yeah. Ho- hopefully they can still do the Yokohama, sh- Yokohama shows that are like next week or this coming week, like the 22nd, 23rd, I think. Yeah. So they haven't, they haven't said anything yet. So we'll have to say. Yeah, saying and Julia was gonna miss that fifteenth show anyway because like headaches or something. Oh yeah. So maybe it's good for her at least that they're postponing it. Uh, so the first night at Corican Hall, and we should mention, I I always forget to do this because then people DM me or message me and ask where you can watch these shows. You know, people don't know. So here you go. Uh, obviously, New Japan. I think everybody knows that. New Japan World for the first one. Uh, for the All Japan show, it's AJPW.TV. And for the Stardom shows, it is Stardom-World.com. Uh, you know, all the shows are up on these streaming services. So definitely check them out there. I'm sure there's other places you can find them too, but that I'm not going to help you with. Uh, but yeah, so Stardom, five-star Grand Prix night one. Uh, we get a cool little opening ceremony with everyone in both blocks. Um, it's funny just seeing like who has at least a general idea of what they should be doing when they get out there and who just clearly has no fucking clue at all. Uh, it's like, there's a few people just like, I don't know, they're just trying to find their spot and they just can't get to their spot for some reason. Uh, Himika skill, by the way, keeping the exact same, I hate everything about this look on her face the entire time, like really has to be commended. Like that was great. Great work by her. Uh, so the first match on the show was Rina versus Hina. Um, I wouldn't normally watch a non-tournament match, but I did watch this. I just kind of wanted to check in on the sisters, I guess. Uh, Dave Meltzer wrote recently that, like, Stardom views them as future big stars, supposedly. Um, so I thought it was kind of interesting, because you know that, like, he, he his, like, source on that, I guess, is Fumi, Fumi Saito, who does seem to be close to Stardom. So, you know, I assume he's getting that from somewhere. Uh... I guess they're continuing the, you know, they're continuing the Hana, the Hana Kimura cosplay as a tribute to her. But Rina coming out to her old song uh, that prominently includes the line, Now You're Going to Die, is more than a little creepy. I think I would change that. And, uh, you know, I think probably just the entire Hana cosplay act, too. Because it, it was creepy already, given Rina's age. But, like, I don't know. It was just, it's just a very unsettling thing for me. Like, that was not a not a good way to start the show. I forgot all about that, and I was like, what the fuck? So, uh, we start out with a fast strike exchange that Rena wins. Uh, she slams and chokes her sister before Hina comes back with her own slam, goes for a cross arm breaker. She does get the arm extended, but Rena makes the ropes very quickly to break. Uh, Rena, Rena came back in an STO that could have looked better. Tries to follow up with a judo throw, but Hina comes back with this awesome like rainmaker spin into a judo throw of her own. I'm like, wow, that was that was crazy. Uh, followed up by two more for a two count. Uh, they trade flash pin attempts, while which include a really great flash pin attempt by Hina for a 2.9 count, and followed by an interesting crucifix takedown into like a very different kind of roll up for another close near fall. Uh, Rina ends up taking Hina down into some kind of wacky hold right after that, and Hina quickly submits. Uh, this is fun while it lasted. Both girls look like they've 
you know, clearly made some progress since the last time I've seen them. Uh, some stuff could look better, but they're both clearly on their way. I would go two and three quarters on this, I think. Yes, yeah, so I only watched the tournament matches, so I didn't watch this specifically, but I will mention I'm I'm fine with uh, Rena doing the, like, Hana cosplay. It's just, I didn't know she was coming out to Hana's old music, so that I don't like, because the lyrics in that song are yeah. exactly <laughs> great, but... <laughs> That's what I was but, saying. The thing, um, the the move she was uh, finished off Rena with, or or Hina with, I think, was one of Hana's finish or submission uh, finishers. It's like the Hydrangea, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. And I guess I, mean, I didn't watch it, so I don't know how good she did it. But I guess she didn't do it that well. But yeah, I say that's probably what it is. But I guess I guess they're just going full Hana cosplay with her now. Yeah, I don't know. Match went uh, four thirty one. By the way, uh, match number two, Death Yamasan. Losing to Starlight Kid in 301. Uh, so they give a rule screen, by the way, in both Japanese and English. Uh, it's pretty much the same as what you already used to from the G1 or Champion Carnival, except 20 minute time limits instead of 30. Uh, it was 15 until this year, but they increased it. So uh, this is the red block, by the way. It's the red and the blue block. Uh, the match starts with some comedy, and then we end up in a big exchange of cradles, leading to the Keychan Bomb, uh, which is that sunset flip thing she does at 301 from Kid to win it. Uh, match was, you know, below average. I thought the comedy, the comedy spot from Yamasan, uh, seemed to take up most of the match, but nothing off or anything. I would say like two and a quarter. Yeah, so yeah, I thought Starlight looked good in the match, especially like the finish. I, I honestly I didn't know what that move was called, but it looks great. So that at least was good. But yeah, it's like for a three minute match, it's like what do you really say about it? Yeah. Uh, match number three, the five star blue block. Uh, Azumi defeating Saya Ida in 803. Uh, so Azumi got the edge early and just like beat her down, uh, mostly stopping her and choking her in the corner and like taunting her. There's a the memorable spot where she yells at Ida to get up, only to like absolutely level her with a form. I mean, just like send her flying. It was a pretty great form. Uh, Ida comes back with a big drop kick, locks her in a Boston Crab, but Azumi is quickly able to crawl over to the ropes. Uh, Ida doesn't break, however, and just, uh, you know, pulls her right back, then keeps trying to sit back on it more and more, but the momentum sends Azumi right over and into a pin attempt for a close near fall. Really cool spot that just, like, Ida, you know, just trying to sit down on this Boston Crab, you know, so much really is, like, what almost got her pinned, so that was a really cool spot. Um, Saya, like, starts, like, laying into Azumi, with chops or just after the five minute mark. Uh, she puts her down with a double chop. She heads up to the top rope, but Azumi recovers and like stops her up there. Uh, Saya like fights back and tries to get the sunset flip power bomb off the top, but Azumi holds on the ropes to block it. Uh, Saya just finally like, pulls her down by the boot when she keeps trying to kick her from up there and then hits a nice missile drop kick for a two count, a Northern Light suplex hole for another near fall. Uh, they trade flash pin attempts, but Azumi puts her down with a middle kick, and then another kick to the head. Uh, Saya kicks out, and then Azumi follows up with three rolling suplexes for another two, another two count. There's a Rana split, a Rana spot by Azumi. They unfortunately kind of botch with Saya like being out of position at first, but Azumi then gets the arm bar for the submission at 8:03. Uh, you have to take points off for that botch right before the finish, but I'm still going with three and a half. This was a super entertaining sub 10 minute match. Um, like stardom is just so ridiculously loaded with these young wrestlers who are like already this good that it's like kind of unfair, but you know, they just, they, this raw, like the thing that really like just came, like just was like in my face throughout this tournament so far is just how good this roster is now. So which is kind of crazy when you think of all the people they've lost. I mean, not just Hana, but also, you know, Arisa Hoshiki and Hazuki and, Kagatora, uh, not Kagatora. <laughs> uh, God, why can't I not remember her uh, name? Kagetsu. Right? Thank you, Kagetsu. We're just completely. Kagatora is the only name in my head. But yes, uh, when you look at all the wrestlers they lost this year, but like this roster is still so deep, especially with the, uh, you know, the DDM people. So I don't know. What do you think of this one? Well, it's like even just talk about people they've lost. Technically, Saya is not even supposed to be in this tournament. She's a replacement for Saki Kashima, who mm-hmm. got taken out. So that like that just goes to show how deep the roster really is. And honestly, for this match, I think 
I think the AZM Arazumi Ida match would would have been better was better than what a Saki AZM Arazumi match would have been. And I like Saki though. Some people don't like Saki. I think she's. Well, good. I, I think I think Saki's great, especially yeah. now that she's a Noeta Tai. I like the, the whole character. I just think like as far as like opponents, I think this worked better in Ida's favor compared to Saki. I agree. But yeah, like overall, this match I think was just a really great showcase for Ida. Like the highlight of the match really was that uh, Boston Crab spot you mentioned earlier where she was really trying to lock it in but then azumi kind of just flipped it into a flash pin which was really good and i love the finish sequence even even with the botch i thought the whole finishing sequence is really great uh match four in the red block konami defeating saya kamatani in 806 um so konami's like video at one point when she came out i noticed this looks exactly like the ps2 startup screen I don't know why, but like it is like Sony should Sony should like take them to court, I guess. But it was really funny. Uh, I never really noticed that. <laughs> uh, even for wrestling genre, like infamously full of screaming, which is what Joshi is, uh, Tall Saya still sa- stands out as a prolific screamer. Uh, she is one hell. Of, she loves to scream. That lady. Uh, you can tell she's still pretty green when she does stuff like uh, kind of look up for Konami to come drop kick her, but the athletic base is still clearly there. And she moves around the ring really, really well for someone at her level of experience. Like a lot of wrestlers, male or female, when they're when they're starting out, like they they can't really, I don't know, they can't run the ropes right or something, or they can't, they just don't seem to have a good like spatial awareness of like what's going on in the ring. And and uh, Commentine doesn't have that problem at all. Her problem is just like she needs to stop looking for moves to come hit her. But I think she that I think you can, you know, that might be easier to teach with experience. So. Um, she showed off a great step up big boot and then a pretty good missile drop kick for a two count. Uh, Konami finally came back and got the triangle choke for the submission at 806. A fun little match. Uh, Saya got to show off her athleticism before being put away. I'm at three stars on this one. Yeah, I liked how uh, dominant Konami was despite Saya technically being a champion right now, even though she's clearly like the lesser in that tag team. But, and obviously in this match, she's lesser than Konami, so I liked the power dynamics there. And like you were saying, like Saya's offense is kind of iffy with me sometimes. Cause it, more, it seems more like she's trying to be flashy rather than like impactful. Like sometimes it works really well. Like in the tag title match where they won the titles, I thought her offense looked great in that, but then it's like here, it's kind of iffy. And I did like how she was kind of trying to do more like Matt wrestling to try and be Konami at her own game, but obviously failing and getting tapped out. But yeah, say overall the, Decent match. She's one of those wrestlers I think will be really good in like two years, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like, she, like, I'm not worried about her. So, uh, match number five, the five star GP blue block. Uh, Micah defeating Momo Watanabe in 8 12. So, Micah promised to give her nephew this win as his first birthday present, which she did live up to that promise. So, there you go. Uh, she just beats the crap out of Momo to start. Like, Turns aside her first attempts to come back, just like swatting her side or dropkick attempt, and then catching her forearm attempt and like effortlessly turning it into a judo throw. So that rolled. Uh, Momo eventually fights back, but this is definitely the Micah show. Uh, she comes back with a series of impressive looking judo throws for a two count just before the five minute mark. She then starts choking Momo from the second rope with her sleeper, which like like she's standing on the second turnbuckle. That looked pretty brutal. She hit a splash off the second rope and then a big delayed suplex for another two count. Uh, Momo hit one of her really nice high kicks, but Micah just shrugged it off and then got Momo in her choke sleeper. Uh, Momo nearly makes it to the ropes before Micah pulled her back and then took her just took her down to the mat, just really ragdolled her. And the crowd was trying to like clap to get Momo back to her feet, which briefly worked before Micah just took her right down again. Uh, and then finally Momo tapped giving Micah what has to be the biggest win of her career so far. Uh, like I said, in 8 minutes and 12 seconds. An excellent finish to what was just a really good one-sided match, almost a squash, to establish Micah as someone not to mess with in this block. Uh, she just looked awesome here with all her legitimate offense, and Momo just bumped her ass off for her. You know, really sold really well. So I'm going 3 and 3 quarters. I thought this was awesome. Yeah, I definitely thought this match was basically all about establishing Micah as a threat just both in the tournament and just in general in stardom like she's the uh, future of stardom champion now so she's got that going for her but it's getting this win over Momo is definitely something that's gonna 
solidify her for like in in her position in the roster. I don't know how much more uh, how many wins she's actually going to get overall, but just getting a win over Momo is a big deal in general. So she's got that going for her, and she she looked great in this match, especially like I love that sleeper off the like hanging sleeper off the um, top rope. That was this nasty spot, and I love Momo. Kind of still had her chance to get to the rope, but then Mike just basically like fell and locked in the submission to finally tap her out. Like Momo, I think went out of her way to really look make Micah look good here. So uh, I definitely really enjoyed this match a lot. It was pretty great. Match number six in the blue block: Natsuko Tora versus Suri. Uh, you know, it went 13-21 with Sayori winning. So she went on the attack early with a knee attack from the apron to the floor. Uh, Tora came back with her usual ringside brawling tactics. Uh, she controlled back in the ring with some pretty boring stuff, honestly, before Sayori hit a face buster for a two count. Uh, Sayori teed off on Tora with kicks and then a running knee to the chest. She, not, she locked Tora in a half crab, but Tora was able to make the ropes to break. The two of them had a big screaming strike exchange after that, which included a funny spot where they eventually just stopped striking and just started screaming right in each other's faces. That was pretty funny. Uh, Tora tied the chain around her leg and went for a leg drop, but Sayori rolled out of the way and hit a running knee strike. Tora is right in the ropes for the cover, though, so the cover wasn't successful. Uh, Tora came back with a or another running knee strike or... Actually, she came back on after another running knee strike with a nice lariat for a two count. Uh, this definitely picked up now. Uh, Sayuri countered Tora running in with a high kick. Uh, and that got another two count. And then hits the final kick right to the head, the buzzsaw kick. And that gets the pan at 13-21. Uh, this started out slow for me. Uh, mostly because I, I don't really like Natsuko Tora that much. Doesn't do a ton for me. But by the end, it got pretty damn good. I will go three and a quarter. Yeah, the match was alright. It's like you said, like it started off too slow and kind of lost me. It kind of got me going in the middle. Like the highlights of the match really were them screaming at each other during that strike exchange, and then just stopping striking, just screaming. And then I really like the uh, wrapping up, wrapping her leg around like with the chain, and then doing the leg drop, even though she missed. Though with how loud uh, those chains were, that ref must have been really out of it to not hear that. I guess, but <laughs> but yeah, like those that's those really like the highlights of the the match for me like you said i'm i'm not a huge fan on natsuko either like but she was fine in this match and the match is kind of skippable for me to be honest uh match number seven himika defeating tam nakano in uh 1617 so this started out with a, a red block by the way so this started out with tom like locking up with himika at the start and she actually actually succeeded in pushing her back like a whole inch <laughs> before Himika immediately pushed her back into the ropes. Uh, she gives her a clean break, though, because she's a nice jumbo princess. Uh, Tom got smarter and immediately took Himika down instead. So he got some nice mat work, although Himika quickly ended up on top there as well. They stand back up where Himika hits a big Samoan drop and a scoop slam and then locked in a camel clutch. Uh, her weird, like, almost manic glee and squeezing Tom is actually kind of creepy. But so I guess that's kind of what she's going for, so good. Uh, she then, like, locked in a half crab, but Tom is able to make it to the ropes to break. Uh, she fought back, but quickly gets put down by Himika with a shoulder block. Uh, she fights back again as we hit the five-minute mark and gets a nice, like, handstand takedown into a cross arm breaker attempt, but she can't quite get Himika's arm extended. Uh, Himika almost powers her way out of it, but can't quite get Tam into the up into the power bomb. When she stands up, uh, ends up back on the mat. She's able to make it to the ropes to break. However, um, Himika comes back with an avalanche in the corner, then just like steamrolls her with a big shoulder block before locking in a Boston Crab. Uh, Tam is quickly able to crawl her way to the ropes. However. Uh, Himika quickly locks her back into a half crab. After a long struggle, she's able to crawl the ropes again. Uh, we hit the 10 minute mark. Uh, Tam starts trying to like chop the big tree down. She starts throwing leg kicks to try to get her down. But Himika comes back with some elbow shots. Uh, it only works for so long before Himika puts her down with a so so clothesline. But Tam then comes back with a nice spin kick to the head and both are down. Uh, Tam tries a knee attack off the top rope, but Himika kicks out too. Uh, she tries to hook her much bigger opponent for a tiger suplex, but can't even get her off her feet. 
Um, you know, she hits a couple kicks, but Himika, like, runs her over with a running knee for a two count. She tries for a powerbomb on Tam, but Tam counters it with a very sloppy-looking reversal. I'm not sure if that was supposed to be a Rana or what, but they just both kind of go down. Uh, very light spin kick, and then hits a running knee for a two count. Uh, Tam finally does hit the, dra- the Tiger Suplex, although it's pretty difficult for her to get any snap on it with the size difference. She, she can't hold the bridge for the pin, uh, you know, stealing all the damage to her back from earlier. Uh, Himeka comes back with a trio of running lariats as we hit the 15-minute mark, but Tam kicks out of two. She goes for the powerbomb again, but Tam back body drops her way out of it. But Himeka very quickly clotheslines her in the back of the head and then finally hits the running powerbomb for the pin at 16-17. Uh, the finish looked great. Uh, this kind of dragged, though, at points, and there was some sloppiness, especially down the stretch. I still enjoyed it, but I can't really go higher than three and a quarter. Uh, Himika selling the arm after the match was a night's touch, though. So. Yeah, see, like you said, I enjoyed this a lot, but it did kind of drag a little bit, especially with, like, it went from all these longer ma- or shorter matches than to this being, like, 16 minutes. So it, this being, like, the first long match on the show kind of hurt it a little bit. And overall, I think, like, I think I think Himika's kind of a better as a tag wrestler, to be honest. Yeah. I think she's I think she's good as a singles wrestler, but it's like her move sets a little bit not like it's not as diverse, I guess. It's a little bit more limited. I think I, I still think she particularly looked really good here. And like you said, I I don't know whose fault that was with that like Rev- Rana reversal kind of thing they were doing. Like, but it just it just looked really bad, and basically Himika had to sell it just because it happened. Like, I don't like I really don't know who's at fault there. But yeah. that was probably my biggest problem with the match, other than like the length and the kind of dragging at points. But yeah, it was it was a decent match, nothing great, I guess. <laughs> Semi-final of the of the show was in the blue block: Utami Hashishida defeating Jungle Kiona in fourteen thirty-eight. Uh, they got right up in each other's faces from the start, as you'd expect for what's become a signature rivalry in in stardom. Uh, Kiona ends up taking an early edge. She clotheslines Utami all the way to the floor. Uh, Utami came back by clotheslining Kiona's legs out from under her on the apron, and she puts her in the Argentine backbreaker on the floor, the torture rack, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Kiona recovers and whips Utami into the barricade before clotheslining her over it, and then she gives Utami a sick powerbomb right onto the apron. They really smacked her neck and shoulders on it. Uh, She picked Utami up and tossed her back in the ring, despite the fact that she could have probably taken the count out, as the ref was up to 16 already. So that would turn out to be her undoing, I guess. Uh, Utami ducked a sliding lariat attempt from Kiona and hit a basement drop kick before hitting the top rope. Uh, Kiona just, like, slapped her right in the damn face to stop her and then went up there with her and fought on the turn. They fought on the, uh, you know, up on the top rope. Uh, Utami got her up on their shoulders and teased, like, just dropping her to the floor, which would have been very dangerous. But thankfully, Kiona fights off and hits some kind of power slam off the top as we get the 10-minute call. Uh, Jungle sets Utami up on the top rope again, tries for the muscle buster, but Utami falls out of it. Uh, Kiona tries to hit a falling lariat, or she hits a falling lariat, and then heads back to the top rope and hits a splash for a two count. And she gets a doctor bomb for a really close near fall. Uh, but Utami comes back with a Rainmaker spin into an STO, and now both girls are down. Uh, after a little bit, Utami got Jungle up into the Argentine backbreaker position as Jungle reached out for the referee to try to get out of it. But Utami, like, spins her and slams her down, but Jungle gets the rope break on the cover. Uh, Utami follows up with two rolling Germans and then carries Jungle around uh, before deadlifting her on the third, and that's enough for the pin at uh, 1438. Very impressive finish. Good power battle. Uh, I, I've seen the two of them have better matches before, though. I still enjoyed myself enough to go three and a half, but uh, you know, didn't quite get to that next level for me. Yeah, I, I think I was a little bit higher on you on this than you were. Like, I just love the whole power battle between them, and it, Tommy hit this like it was like a submission, almost like a GTR, but it was like she just like hit it and then like, kept it there. I don't know how to describe that move really, but I really enjoyed that a lot, and then. I did like um, Jungle like grabbing onto the ref to try and not to tap out to that torture rack, and then Utami hit like I'm bad with move names. It was like the blue, it looked like a blue thunder bomb. I can't really describe it, but and then I really enjoyed the finish with her hitting like two Germans and then kind of just carrying her around and then finally hitting the third one to put her away. Yeah, it was. But awesome. yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed this match a lot. The main event was Julia defeating Mayu Iwatani. In 1728, 
in the battle of the Wonder of Stardom versus World of Stardom champions. The Wonder got the win here. The White Belt beats the, beats the Red Belt. Uh, you know, things start out here with some chain wrestling until Mayu hits Julia with a huge slap to the face and then a big kick to the back, but Julia kicks out at one. Uh, Mayu stays on her, and it's a big drop kick to see to Julia for a two count. Uh, you know, Julia came back and took Mayu down to this really nasty look, looking submission, really stretching her arms back before Mayu makes the ropes, and we get the five minute call. Um, they fought up to the top rope at one point, like after the ten minute call, and the crowd seems to be really into that with this like super intense clapping. Uh, you know, they were like really into the top rope fight before Julia hit a big superplex for a two count. Uh, she went for a shoulder breaker, but Maya reversed it into her kneeling tombstone, just drilling Julia right on her head. And both girls were down again. Uh, the two of them had a big street, street, uh, big screaming strike exchange before Maya hits a crucifix bomb and then a huge razor's edge on Julia. Just like she carried her halfway across the ring uh, after setting her up on the top rope before just dropping her right on her neck. Like, Jesus Christ. Uh, it just looked r- so brutal. She head up to the top rope again, hit a frog splash for a two count, then a dragon suplex hold, but Julia kicks out again, and poor Maya looks like she's about to cry at that point. Uh, she set Julia up and head- went back up for the moonsault, but despite hitting a beautiful moonsault, uh, Julia rolled out of the way. So we get the 15-minute call as Julia hits a step-up kick to a kneeling Mayu, and then both are down again. Uh, Mayu actually manages to recover first as she pulls Julia up by her hair and then ducks a big spinning lariat attempt by Julia. Uh, tries the dragon suplex again, but Julia quickly spins out of it and hits a sick backdrop suplex, uh, just dropping Mayu right on her head. The, the counter of it, like the way she spun right into the backdrop was so cool. Uh, Julia hit a falcon arrow and then tried to lock in the armbar on her and then gets a Kimura, but uh, Mayu is able to get her foot on the bottom rope to break it. Uh, we get three minutes left in the time limit. Uh, Julia hits her wrist clutch kneeling tombstone, which I think is the glorious driver, and then kind of sits out with it into more like a Michinoku driver, which is apparently the glorious driver too, and that gets the pin at 1728. Even Julia seemed moderately surprised by that result, which I thought was funny. Uh, great ending. Julia just put together a flurry that put Maya away at the end. I thought they were going to go with the 20-minute draw, but you know, instead they decided to do that, which I don't mind at all. Uh, this match fucking ruled. Easily match of the night. Uh, quite by a lot, really. I'm going to go four and a quarter. All action most of the way. Both girls look great. Can't really ask for much more than that in a tournament main. Uh, you know, I just, you know, and I'm glad I watched them spoil because, like I said, I thought the 20 minute draw was going to happen, but we got that finish out of nowhere. Uh, overall, a fun show with an awesome main event. Can't ask for much more than that. Yeah, I was definitely really surprised that Julia actually pulled out the win here. I was pretty much either thinking it was either going to be a draw or Mayu was going to win because I think Julia is basically going to be winning most of her matches except, but, and I thought this was like one that she could easily lose, but I guess, I guess not. And it's like, like you said, I, I think this match is great. Great way to finish off the show. Great main event. Like Mayu is Mayu, which whenever she's on a game, you're almost always guaranteed a great match. But I thought Julia really hung in there with her. I think they were smart to lay out the match the way they did because Julia is so much better when she's more in control of the match, like the one doing most of the offense. And then you got Mayu, who's one of the best sell- sellers ever, really. And she really made uh, Julia's offense look great. And I think it's probably Julia's best match thus far in Stardom, oh, yeah. in my opinion. Oh, yeah. I agree. I've, so, I've seen. Yeah, I totally agree. So yeah. Hmm. so, yeah, like, I just thought it was a great match and a surprising finish. I did watch this spoiled, but still, like, I was, I'm so even days late like a week later i'm still surprised she actually beat mayu so like beating mayu period is a big deal but beating her when she's red champ is even a bigger deal yeah so what well, i'm definitely down for a rematch for the title if they want to do it but i don't know if they will because julia is the white belt champion so uh the second night august night the corrigan uh the, so the first night was good uh you know four star main event and a bunch of really good undercard matches in the three-star range. This second night, though, blew away the first night. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I thought the second night was awesome. Like, show of the year level. Oh, yeah, there was, like, nothing bad on this show and a lot of great matches on the show. So, yeah. night two definitely blew away. Like, um, I compare it to um, DDT's night one of King of DDT a little bit. I think this definitely had more great matches, but as far as, like, card-to-card 
overall show. I definitely think that's pretty much a good comparison because like nothing bad, everything was either good to great. Yeah. So I definitely enjoyed this night of uh, Grand Prix a lot. So this was August 9th at Corrigan, the second night of the Grand Prix. Uh, it opened. We I didn't do, I didn't watch the non-tournament opener. So match two was five star GP Blue Block, uh, Micah defeating Saya Ida in 719. Uh, Micah, before the match, promised to show to show the gorilla Saya that the human beings are stronger. I don't know why that was so funny to me, but I, I, I like laughed out loud at that. It was pretty funny. Um, I always love when two wrestlers act like the bell going the bell going off is like a gun in like a fucking race or something because they just like ram right at each other with shoulder blocks and like they both got mad when they couldn't knock the other one down. It was a great start to the match. Uh, Micah finally won the knockdown war. She slammed Saya a few times for good measure. Uh, she started going into her judo throws, which is always fun. Uh, Ida made her normal, like, spirited comeback, uh, including repeated chops in the corner. She kept chopping her back in the middle of the ring and then, like, pounded on her in the middle of the ring with forearms as we get the five-minute call. Uh, we got another big shoulder block battle. Uh, it was won at first by Micah, but then Ida came right back and knocked her back down, too. Uh, she heads up top and hits a missile drop kick for a two count, then a nice Northern Light suplex hold for a much closer near fall. But Micah came back with a sleeper hold, which she turned into a Uranage when Ida almost made the ropes for a two count. That was awesome. And she picked her up and hit her cross armed STO, and that's finally enough for the pin at 719. I say finally. I mean, it just felt like a battle, even though it only won seven minutes. Like It felt like by the time she beat her, she really earned that win. Uh, so yeah, the match was a lot of fun. Just like two sturdy gals really taking it to each other. Uh, the finish was a little out of nowhere, but that's going to happen with these shorter matches. Uh, but it, it definitely felt like Micah earned it, even though it just got, like I said, just kind of came like she hit the move and then won. Uh, I'm going to go three and a half on this. Like, definitely a fun opener to the tournament anyway. Uh, and Micah starts out 2-0, and while Ida is now 0-2. I say... I'm a little bit lower than you on this match, but I still thought it was really good. Like, it was kind of a more basic match, but just the fire both girls had that kind of elevated even more. So, honestly, just them them being fired up was really like the highlight. And then I loved like mid match they kind of just showed Liger out in the stands. Yeah, because he's like he's associated with DDM, right? Is that? I don't. I don't maybe. Yeah. I know he. I thought he's just like there training stardom and ge- girls in general. Yeah, I think he's but... like specifically training DDM or something. But I could be right. Oh, that's could cool, be though. Right. Yeah, so they, they cut to Liger. He's like, yeah, <laughs> I thought that was great. He's got the mask on and everything, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, was, but yeah, so match number three. Here's where this card, like, fucking kicks in the high gear. Maya Iwatani defeating Starlight Kid in 1333. Um, I don't know if I'm out to lunch on this match because I didn't see a ton of hype for it going in. But this match was fucking incredible. Uh, I really like, like, this may have been my favorite match of the entire fucking COVID era since it started, like, empty slash clap crowds, I want to say. Like, this match was so good. Uh, I really could not believe how good it was. So we'll, we'll go through it here. So it, it does start with an early bosh, so I guess that goes to my, uh, it goes against what I just said. But um, I actually think it was the fault of a strangely loose ring rope. Uh, Mayu was going for, like, a springboard and just, like, bounced right off it. But luckily she landed on her feet, and they are able to keep going without missing a beat. So I don't think it really bo- doesn't bother me anyway. It also helps that it was in, like, the first 30 seconds of the match, so who cares? Um, Mayu just kicks the crap out of Starlight Kid with soccer kicks to the back. Uh, at this point, my girlfriend Nicole walked into the room, and she was like, you know, this again, still very early in the match. And Mayu was kicking this girl as hard as she can. And Nicole's making faces like, you know, the, the general faces I get sometimes watching Japanese wrestling. Like, what the fuck are you watching? Why? This is so, so violent. And I see the face she's making. And I just tell her, these two are like best friends, by the way. Like, that's her best friend that she's kicking as hard as she possibly can. And it's like, yeah. And Nicole's like, I'd hate to see what she'd do to her anime. Uh, Starlight Kid makes a comeback around the five minute mark, starting with a springboard crossbody, which Mayu bumps right on her neck for somehow. I don't even get how that's really physically possible, but yeah, she took a crossbody on her neck. Truly like the female Ibushi. I don't, I don't understand how she pulled that off. Uh, Mayu hits an awesome spinning back kick as a counter, just nearly takes poor Kid's head off with another kick, just killing this poor girl. 
She hits a top rope double stomp for a two count. Uh, she gets Kid locked into a half crab, and Kid's selling is great as she just crawls over the ropes to break. Uh, Mayu immediately follows it up with her usual, like, super gross drop kick with Kid in the ropes. But Kid comes back with a nice flying lariat that Mayu again takes this crazy bump on. Uh, Kid ends up, you know, back on the apron where she gives Mayu a DDT straight down onto it with Mayu hanging up in the ropes and then follows up with a crossbody from the top rope to the floor. Uh, this is where I just wrote down, how the fuck is this match two? Or I guess really match three, but match two of the tournament matches. Uh, we get the 10 minute call right after that. Uh, back in the ring, Kid hits her cross-legged Fisherman's Buster uh, for a two count. She goes back up to the second rope and hits a h- huge spinning DET on Mayu when she tries to stop her, which again, Mayu takes right on her head. Uh, Kid then steps on Mayu, just like Mayu often does before going to the, going to the top rope, and, which I thought was a great little touch. Uh, she goes to the middle rope for a moonsault, and that gets a two count. Uh, Mayu kicks out of two. Kid tries to set her up for a sunset flip powerbomb, but Mayu stops her and turns it into, like, some kind of gut buster. There, there's probably a move name for that move I'm not thinking of, but it, it was just a great counter. Uh, Mayu then hits a moonsault to her back and picks her up and goes for her deadlift dragon suplex. But Kid turns it into this, like, flipping driver thing that just drops Mayu right on her neck. It looks for, like, the bumps in this match are just so ridiculous. Uh, Mayu still kicks out, too. She super kicks her and hits a German suplex before locking her in the dragon sleeper in midair in the deadlift position. And Kid quickly taps out 1333. Uh, holy shit, this match. Like I said, I don't know if I just wasn't looking in the right place or was trying to avoid spoilers or something, but this should be getting way more hype. Like, if you only watch one match we talk about today, this should be it. It was Mayu kicking the crap out of her until Kid came back and Mayu just bumped like a mad woman for her all over the place. Like a perfect, uh, you know, uh, senior versus protege type match with like, you know, Kid just really giving her all and like coming up just short and like, you know, Starlight Kid, I, I knew she had this kind of performance in her, but this is the best Starlight Kid match I've ever seen. I went four and a half. I mean, maybe you think that's nuts for a 13 and a half minute match, but I loved every second of this. So Mayu and Kid are both now one and one. <laughs> this match is so awesome. Yes, hey, I'm not as high as far as like oh this is like one of the best matches in covid but i still might thought this match fucking ruled like if i had to if, i don't really do star ratings that much but if i went star ratings probably like four four and a quarter ish like so not quite as high as you but i still thought this match is fucking great like you, like you said i think this is like the best starlight performance i've definitely ever seen and my use selling to this was just insane like you mentioned like the selling a cross body by bumping on your neck like <laughs> like i I had to like rewind that, to watch it again. So I was like, "Did that really just happen?" <laughs> yeah, I did that too. It's and great. even like, I think you said like she reversed um, that. Oh, I don't care what it was. The the maybe the the dragon the suplex. Thing. Yeah, like she reversed into like some driver and dropped her right on her neck again, and then that DT spot over the rope that Mayu just like sold it like death, and. Mayu's high, like Mayu's like selling was really the highlight of the match and like took it up to the next level. But I still think this is like Starlight's best performance that I've seen. Yeah, I mean, just an incredible match. So definitely one I'd recommend watching. I mean, really watch this entire show because as we're gonna get into, that's the first of many four star plus matches for me. So the next match, the five star Grand Prix Grand Prix Blue Block, uh, Momo Watanabe defeating Azumi in nine fifty four. Uh, the match starts off with Momo just, like, throwing Izumi around the ring by her hair repeatedly and then stepping on her face. Uh, stardom wrestlers sure li- do like to be mean to their friends. <laughs> it's really funny. Uh, we get a hard elbow exchange before Izumi finally comes back with her Rana into an octopus hold and then another Rana. Uh, she kicks Momo from the apron to the outside after Momo rolls to the floor. That kick looked nasty. Uh, Momo comes back with a ridiculous high kick, uh, catching Izumi when she left the top rope and tried to come back, tried to come off it with something or other. Uh, just fucking destroyed her with this kick. I, I don't always love those spots where you're not even sure what the wrestler who jumped off the top was attempting before they got hit, but this kick was so ridiculous that I kind of have to allow it in this case. I mean, it looks so good, just killed her. So whatever, I don't know what Izumi was going for, but it looks so good. Uh, Momo came back with more kicks, a double knee attack off the top rope for a close two count. Uh, Azumi answered with an 
awesome spinning arm bar off the middle rope into uh, or spinning arm breaker, I guess you would say, off the middle rope into a submission attempt on the mat. That spinning arm breaker was so cool looking. Uh, Momo escaped and eventually answered with yet another kick right to the face. Uh, she hooked Azumi and went for the crossface chicken wing, but Azumi rolled through it into a pin attempt for a very close 2.9 count. Uh, Momo then came back with another high kick right to the face and then finally got the chicken wing, and Azumi had no choice but to tap at 9.54. Uh, this was another awesome match. Both girls just working at a nonstop pace, having about as great of a sub-10 minute match as you can have. I'm going four and a quarter. My only real complaint is I wish these two had gotten like five more minutes. This was so good. And they're both now also at one and one. Yes, uh, again, I love this match too. Like, I do agree. I think they could have used a couple more minutes. But like, that's really minor complaint. I thought they did great in their time they had. They was super fast paced. I love that. Uh, like, she had this move. I think Uzumi had this move. I think it's like a Rana DDT almost, which looked crazy. And I did agree with that uh, kicking, like that kick off the top rope. Like, I don't know what Uzumi was really trying to go for, but I don't care because Momo basically kicked her head off. <laughs> it was so, such a cool kick. She killed her. <laughs> Yeah, and like that spinning like arm bar, arm breaker, whatever it was. I don't know what it was, what what the name is, but that spot looked great. So I I really don't have really any complaints about this match. I thought these two like went out there tried to kill each other, and it was awesome. Yeah, I mean that was a theme for the night, and they definitely did it. Uh, the red block Konami defeating Tam Nakano, or I'm sorry, reverse that Tam Nakano defeating Konami uh, in 10:50 with a tiger suplex hold. Uh, the big highlight early on was Ta- Tam hitting a crossbody to the floor, but Konami essentially no-selling it, and then jumping right up with a truly ridiculous, like, sliding kick from the apron to Tam still on the floor. I mean, she, like, took her head off on it. There, If you love kicks, folks, this is the show for you. Because, I mean, Stardom is a promotion for you in general, too. They have so many wrestlers who throw amazing kicks. But, like, this show in particular was, like, the, the night of the kick. Just people kicking each other's heads off. Uh, Konami, so they end up in a big, or Konami and Tam end up in a big kick exchange, but neither really winning. Uh, in fact, it ends with both of them exchanging kicks and going down. Uh, Konami hits another really sick, uh, sliding kick to Tam while she's hung up in the ropes. But Tam comes back with this great rolling cradle after running Konami into the ropes, and it's a close near fall. Uh, Tam fires back with a series of kicks of her own before Konami ducks the last one and puts her in a sleeper. Uh, but Tam just like lands, basically like throws herself and uh, lands on Konami's back to force the break and then hits the Tiger Suplex hold for the pin at 10.50. Uh, the finish was a little out of nowhere, but that's going to happen with these shorter matches, so whatever. Uh, yet another really fun match. I would go three and three quarters, all action, both of them throwing some really nice kicks, like I said. And we got another match ending with both of them at one and one. Yeah, it's a pretty fun match. I like how like the po- like the pre match promo video Tam was saying her game plan was to basically kick the hell out of Konami before she got taken to the mat, which worked for like two minutes before she ended up getting taken to the mat anyway. <laughs> and the finish, I like. I think the like the kick that Tam used before the suplex kind of didn't look that good, but beyond that, I enjoyed the finish, but. Yeah, it was a decent match. It was fun. Not nothing really like go anywhere to see, I guess. Uh, match number six was in the blue block. Uh, Itami Hayashishida defeating Natsuko Tora by DQ in ten fifteen. Uh, Tora attacked Utami before the bell, and before she could before she could even get her mask, jacket, or belt off, uh, then she took the mask and stomped on it because she's a dastardly woman, I guess. Uh, this was the first thing all night that didn't do a great job holding my interest. At least at first. Uh, Utami got Tora down on, into her trademark sleeper, uh, but Tora was able to get her foot on the bottom rope to force the break uh, just as we hit the five minute mark. Uh, we then hit the predictable ref bump as Utami accidentally clotheslined the referee. Uh, Tora had to, went to the floor to get her chain and hit Utami with it when she came out to try to stop her. And then she put a pile of chairs on her and followed up with a senton. Off the apron, onto the chairs. Nasty looking spot. So that was at least uh, the highlight, definitely the highlight of the match. Uh, we get a slam on the chain and a nice lariat from Tora back in the ring for a two count. Uh, Tora hit a splash off the top. Utami kicked out again. Uh, Tora went up up to the top rope with with her chain, but Utami cut her off. 
Uh, Tor hit a kind of weak chain shot to knock her off the top rope and then wrap the chain around her neck to choke her from up there, or wrap the chain around Utami's neck, I mean. Uh, Utami was able to f- elbow her way out of it and get Tor up on her shoulders for the Argentine backbreaker, even with the chain still around her neck. Uh, Tora went to her eyes to break it and then just starts choking with the chain, uh, just hanging her up from the outside of the ring back in. Uh, so the referee finally calls the DQ because I guess an attempted murder by hanging is finally too far for this referee. Uh, so there you go. Utami by DQ. Not bad or anything. Definitely our, you know, I thought this was our first, like, fine match of the night. I would say three stars flat. There was some good stuff, but the dumb ending took it down a bit for me. I, I don't give a shit about the chain and Tora. And Tora is all about the chain shit in general. Just does not sit well with me. And, you know, DQ finishes, not great. But what are you going to do? Uh, but Utami does join Micah in being our only 2 0 wrestler so far, while Tora remains winless. So. Yeah, I'll say the match is kind of fine overall. Like, the highlights really were uh, Natsuko doing the senton off the apron onto the chairs. And then I think Utami did like a suplex or like suplexed uh natsuko onto her chain at one point but that and then like the finish really like the like the key points of the match and beyond that it was just kind of there and then like the post match with her like natsuko getting mad and like her attacking like i think it was like rena and hina just attacking them looked really weak and I, i did like her like continuing to choke utami after the match was over but beyond that like it was just there, really. Yeah. Kind of like the lowest point of the show. Uh, after, I mean, yeah, what, like, when she got mad at the rap, that was kind of stupid. Cause it's like, uh, do you, I'm sorry, you thought hanging somebody was legal? Like, what the fuck is your problem? <laughs> but sure, I guess. Uh, match number seven was in the blue block with Jungle Kiona and Siri. Uh, Siri got the win in 1239. Uh, so this match started off with some really nice chain wrestling to start. Before Siri hit a nice kick, but Jungle came back with a series of shoulder blocks and a falling splash for a two count. Uh, Siri soon took over and choked out Kiona as she hit a nasty pair of running knee attacks to the corner, one to the gut and one to the side of her head while she was seated, and then went for the cross arm breaker. Uh, Kiona nearly powered her way out before Siri took her back down and briefly did get the arm extended, but that allowed Jungle to get her foot on the bottom rope to break. Great little spot there. Uh, Jungle came back with the Canadian backbreaker just after the five minute mark and then like basically kept her in that position and like draped her over the top rope for a running drop kick. That looked pretty cool. Uh, Sayuri came back over for a little bit, but then like, or t- took back over for a little bit, I should say, but then ran into a huge forearm from Kiona, which looked awesome. Like Kiona just drilled her. Uh, Kiona then hit the ropes, but Sayuri came or went behind her and dropped her with a German suplex. But Kiona no-sold and then ran Siri over with Lariat. Great exchange there. Uh, the crowd here was clapping extra loud now as Kiona set Siri up. Uh, but Siri countered from the front suplex position into a guillotine, just taking her down to the mat. Uh, Kiona powered her way out anyway into a suplex and both girls were down again. Uh, Kiona, you know, slammed Siri and hit a big splash to the back off the top rope. Really great air on that one. Uh, Siri tried to come back with a kick, but Kiona caught her leg and hit a dragon screw and then locked in a scorpion deathlock. Uh, Siri quickly made the ropes to break it. And then Kiona had a kind of weak running clothesline in the corner and then set Siri up for the muscle buster. But Siri escaped it, escaped it into a headlock, and that looked awesome. Uh, we get the 10-minute call, and she, like, pounds away with knees on Kiona and then takes her down to a cross-arm breaker. Uh, Kiona's selling is great here as Siri transitions it into a Fujiwara armbar instead. Uh, but Kiona is able to get her foot on the bottom rope to break. Great transition. Uh, Siri then tries to follow up with a Rana, uh, but, or something, I don't know. But Kiona caught her in midair and turned it into a sit-out powerbomb for a two-count. Just such an awesome finishing stretch here. Uh, she tried to power Siri up into a gut-wrench position, but Siri gets out and hits a high kick. Then a fisherman's carry face buster onto her knees for a two-count. Uh, she spins her back into the Fujiwara armbar, then traps the arm and turns it into her signature submission, the Suzaku, and or traps the other arm, I should say. And Kiona finally submits at 12.39. Uh, so this was yet another awesome match in a series of them tonight. I'm going four and a quarter. It was all about Kiona's power versus Siri's kicks and submissions. In the end, Kiona just got caught. A simple but very effective story. Uh, and Siri starts out 2-0. Jungle is now 0-2. 
Uh, you know, like all the DDM wrestlers are great additions, but I honestly think, like from a work rate standpoint, especially like Siri is like such an amazing pickup for Stardom. I mean, this is a wrestler who like was so underrated once he wrestled elsewhere in Joshi, and like just was such a great wrestler. Like her submissions are so great, her kicks are great. Um, you know, like that that like legitimate grappling kind of background. It really adds another dimension to the Stardom undercards, especially. And even to like to these like a semi main event slot here, so like she is like a low key an amazing addition to this roster. So definitely a, a big big pickup for Stardom. But uh, like you said, I think Siri is really the like I enjoy DDM a lot as a faction in general. But as far as like work rate kind of stuff, I think Siri is definitely like the best addition to the roster in that regard. I think Himika and Julia will get there eventually. But like you said, I think I think Siri was kind of underrated on her early return to uh, Joshi and in this match in particular I thought it was a great like power battle between her and Jungle Jungle more power based like you said and then Siri kind of more striking and submissions and I love the uh, like hanging over the top rope arm hold that Siri had on early on on Jungle and the match just flew by honestly like we're doing the time counts and I was surprised at how quickly it was going by. The striking was excellent, but it's Siri, so duh. And um her reversing the jungle buster into like a sleeper hold and then followed in like into a twisting arm breaker was really good. Yeah. But overall it was like really great match between these two. Yeah, I mean this match was awesome. Uh the main event, the five star GP red block, uh Himika I, it's a big surprise for me, at least. I don't know if you disagree. Defeating Julia in fifteen fourteen. Did this stun you as much as it stunned me? I, I could not believe she won this. I, I if you would have told me before, go, like going into the tournament, I don't think she would have won this. But after Julia beat Mayu, I was like, Julia needs to lose some of these because I don't think she's winning the block. So Himika is just about as good as anyone to be the winner, especially because I doubt they're going to do a title challenge for Himika versus Julia. I mean, they always could, but I don't really see them doing it immediately, especially since they have the TAM title match locked up down like in Yokohama. And then I guess we'll see after that, but it's not super surprising just because Julia needs to lose some of these matches. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I was pretty stunned, but I guess you're, I guess that's a good point. Uh, so Julia did not want to lock up with her at first before finally taking her down to the mat but she couldn't keep her down very long. Uh, the early portion was all Julia basically trying to figure out some way to neutralize Jumbo's obvious size advantage, but nothing worked well for her at first with Himika just tossing her uh, tossing her around with ease. Uh, Himika, you know, hooked Julia's arms around the top rope and hit a big running clothesline and then an even bigger second one that sent Julia all the way to the top, over the top into the floor. Uh, we get a big elbow exchange out there where both girls teased, uh, teasing being counted out before they both leap back in the ring just before the 20 count. Uh, we get the five-minute call as the elbow exchange continues back in the ring. Uh, Julia drop kicks Himika's leg and then gets her in a quick STF, but Himika makes the ropes. Uh, Himika catches Julia on the top rope and tries to hit a power bomb on her, but Julia spins out of it into a weird-looking Rana. Uh, I'm not even sure you can call that sloppy, per se. It just looked kind of awkward and weird, but not that big a deal. Uh, so then we get, like, you know, both girls... Oh, before that, they Julia tries to, like, backdrop suplex Himika, but that, you know, that was a poor plan on her part and doesn't work out for her. Uh, Himika elbows her way out of it and hits a big Samoan drop. They trade running lariats and big boots before Himika catches her with a counter lariat and both are down. Uh, we get the double knockout tees, but they both beat the count ten, uh, the count of 10 at 9. Uh, both girls stand up into another elbow exchange as we get the 10-minute call. Um, I have to say, some of the faces Himika was making here were pretty goofy. Just very like, I am trying hard to look deranged or laughing or something. Uh, these faces did not really work for me. But it's very brief. Uh, it was really just during this little sequence, so no big deal. Uh, Julia gets a really nice takedown back into the STF again. But Himika makes the ropes here. Uh, Julia hits a pretty nasty running boot when Himika hung up over the middle rope and then goes to the backdrop again. Uh, Himika still won't go, so Julia slaps her right in the face pretty damn hard, too. Uh, and then finally gets the backdrop. 
I would have liked that moment to feel a little bigger after all that build, I guess, but what can you do? Things are still awkward right now with only clapping. I think that would have been bigger in front of a crowd that could actually cheer. Uh, Julia then hits a Michinoku driver for a two count. Uh, Himaka responds with a running knee attack to a kneeling Julia for a two count, and then a lariat, but Julia kicks out at one. She hits another lariat, but only gets a two count. Uh, Himaka gets Julia up into the Argentine backbreaker, and then slams her down from there, but Julia kicks out again. We get the 15-minute call as Himaka hits her huge running powerbomb, and that's finally enough for the pin at 15-14. So this match had some issues, but then was still awesome. Like, I think my main issue is just, like, Himika is still a little green, which isn't totally unexpected when she's only been wrestling since the very end of 2017. Uh, Her facial expressions, I mentioned, a little weird. And the other big issue I have with her, I guess, is for someone who uses a lot of lariats, I think she has a lot of room to improve on them. I think she needs to hit them a little harder. But, uh, you know, she definitely, or just make them look better in general. But this was still a really good uh, big versus little. I would say, well, Julia's not little, but big versus not so big, I guess, uh, match, despite those kind of flaws. Uh, I would go four stars flat on it. Uh, Julia was great, just bumping her ass off. And Himaka's power offense was very good, other than the issues we mentioned. So, you know, it, it was not quite the level of the best matches on the show, but it was still an awesome match. And Himaka starts out 2-0, and while Julia drops to 1-1. and Yeah, definitely think it was a good main event. It compared to other matches on the show, it was definitely lesser than that. But I mentioned it when we were talking about uh, Tam versus Himika, that Himika is, I think, is better as a tag wrestler. But I still think this is probably like her best uh, singles match that I've seen. But I definitely think she's still better working um, as a tag wrestler. But I liked how like it was pretty fairly even for the most part. Like obviously Himika was pretty dominant early on, and then finally Julia was able to take back control and kind of dominate the match a little bit but yeah really Julia was really good at selling which for Himika which isn't something I don't think she's particularly that great at sometimes but at least for this match I thought she was really good at selling Himika's offense and yeah that one Rana you mentioned like that it you said I don't think it was bad it was just kind of awkward and that was really like the biggest complaint about the match for me I actually didn't mind her um, facial expressions to be honest uh, Himika's like it, it, it's kind of goofy I guess but I, I didn't mind them as much I kind of in a way I sort of liked them a little bit but overall like, I thought it was a great match but lesser than previous matches in the tournament yeah I mean it was a it, it was like you said like not quite to level the best but still an awesome match uh, mm-hmm. Himika ripping Julia's love 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 catchphrase and then mocking Julia like about all of uh, DDM winning except for her was pretty funny. Uh, mm-hmm. She pointed out it's the first time Julia has lost a singles match in stardom. They definitely teased some dissension here, I thought. so. And Julia did not take part in the pose afterwards after Himika delivered the catchphrase instead of hers. I thought it was interesting that they're teasing some dissension between Julia and Himika already, given this, the unit's still so new. Yeah, I'm curious how like why they're doing that. Especially, like you said, like the faction's so new, and I don't know if like I know some people don't like Julia, but I think she's a better leader for DDM than Himika would be if they decided to like kick her out or something. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm curious when they're if if or when they're gonna do a Stardom draft again because I mean, depending on how this Yokohama show goes, uh, TCS might need to be finding new homes. Yeah. So this was just an outstanding fucking show. Uh, four matches of four stars or better. Uh, a show with a year contender, honestly. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to the rest of the five star whenever they're able to resume. Uh, hopefully, like you said, what, the 22nd, you said, maybe, is the next scheduled show? Well, that, that's going to be the Yokohama show. Like, the Yokohama Bunka, not Bunka. Um, oh, right. The, the non, right. That's not five stars. It's a non-five star show. Yeah, that yeah. has, like, that That has the Mayu and Siri t- red belt match and then the next night's uh tam and julia rematch for the white belt right and then what what's the what's the disband match again i forgot about that it's uh oedo tai versus tcs i can't remember the participants but basically if tcs loses they have to disband but i don't think oedo tai has any like stip if they lose so i don't know we'll see what happens i guess all right so definitely hopefully those shows get to run i assume we'll find out something uh in the next few days probably so 
definitely check those out stardom world so let's wrap this show up here go ahead tj and give me your plugs uh really only plug is my uh, podcast the uh, one wrestling podcast it's kind of a similar structure to what amakase is so if you like amakase maybe check us out uh this week it's it's me and my wife uh caitlin we just talk about whatever wrestling we talk we want to feel like talk about that week mostly we do pro and joshi and stuff like that but we talk a little bit of wrestling like western wrestling too at least we talk about news and shit like that but uh this coming week or this week we're i think it should come out like tuesday we're going to be talking about all the tournaments which is basically what i've been doing this whole weekend is binging all of ddt princess cup and stardom so if you feel like checking us out uh I guess see what we had to say. You already know what I have to say about the five star after listening to this. But if you want to see what I had to think about DDT and uh, Princess Cup, give us a listen. All right. And folks, you can follow us on Twitter at Russell Omakase, Wrestling Women Fit. Uh, don't forget to check out the Patreon if you want to hear my thoughts on the King of DT and Tokyo Joshi, Princess Cup. It's all up there uh, at patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. Uh, next week on Omakase on the free feed. Uh, we're gonna have the we're gonna cover the finals of King of DT, the Corican, with the semis and finals from next weekend. Uh, we're also gonna talk the third week of New Japan Strong, um, you know the 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 finals of the New Japan Cup USA, and then we'll preview the New Japan Jingu show. Um, I guess we'll be Jeff from Voices of Wrestling. I think Andy said he might be able to come on too. I'm waiting to hear back, but definitely Jeff, maybe Andy too. So tune in for that. In the meantime, folks, uh, thank you as always for listening. And we'll see you next time.